On November 1st, 2007, Justin Gaines, an 18-year-old college student, went out to Wild Bills, a popular nightclub in Duluth, Georgia. At 2 a.m. on what is now November 2nd, Justin was seen outside the club in the parking lot. He was in the midst of calling multiple friends trying to get a ride home. Unfortunately, none of his friends could pick him up, and he was never heard from again. It's been over 15 years since Justin went missing. Foul play is suspected, and investigators are still searching for the people responsible. Hey everyone, welcome to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a former police detective and licensed private investigator. Each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe together we can help solve a case. I just wanted to take a second um, before we get any further. This is actually my first episode that I'm recording since Detective Perspective has been released. I recorded the first three episodes prior to any premiere. So this is my first time to speak to you guys now that I've seen some of the response. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much for listening on audio or watching on YouTube, for taking the second to rate the episode or to leave a review or to leave a comment. I read everything. And you guys have been so positive. And even with your your critiques or suggestions, you were respectful and, and, and actually we're already starting to implement some of the things you guys said. One of them being the background music. There's a few of you who were having trouble focusing with that. I'm going to work on that. Also, some of you mentioned that I was talking a little too fast. I will say if you, uh, you've listened to me before on Crime Weekly or even on Breaking Homicide, I'm a fast talker. So there, <laughs> there is a speed that I just naturally go. Uh, but I am working on getting better at that, maybe slowing down, taking an extra beat. So bear with me on that. But I will say you just got to kind of love me for what I am because that's that's who I am. And there's only so much I can do. But I am working on it, I promise you. But again, I appreciate all the support, everyone coming over, the, the, the amount of views and listens that we had on the first episode were way more than I expected. And I think it's a good thing because overall it's going to help more people uh, learn about these cases that we're going to cover every week. And I think this is a good spot here to mention that if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing to the channel, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you use. I would really appreciate it. It really helps the channel grow and therefore gets more exposure on these cases, which is always a good thing when you're trying to find answers for the families. All right, I think we got all that out of the way. Let's dive into this week's case. Born on March 31, 1989, Justin Glenn Gaines spent his early childhood in Ohio with his mother, Erica. When Justin was four, Erica met Stephen Wilson. The two soon got married, and Stephen became a father figure to Justin. Eventually, the family decided to relocate from Ohio to Snellville, Georgia, where Stephen was originally from. In the spring of 2007, Justin graduated from Brookwood High School. Later that fall, he enrolled at Gainesville College, now known as the University of North Georgia. During the week, Justin lived in Athens attending college. He was doing well in school, earning a mix of A's and B's, and appeared to be someone who was well-liked by his peers. On the weekends, Justin would return home to Snellville. In order to make some extra money, Justin would frequently assist Stephen with his roofing jobs. On November 1st, 2007, 18-year-old Justin left college and returned home to Snellville. That evening, he had plans to join his friends for a night out at a popular nightclub called Wild Bill's in Duluth. Being a regular attendee at Wild Bill's, Justin had VIP tickets for that particular night, known as Thirsty Thursday. As Justin got ready for the club, he dressed in a long sleeve gray shirt with Abercrombie written across the front, blue jeans with holes, and flip-flops. He also wore a diamond stud earring. Justin's friend Chris and Chris's girlfriend picked him up, and they drove to the bar. According to Atlanta Magazine, the plan was to arrive before 11 p.m. to take advantage of their VIP tickets. Unfortunately, they arrived late, meaning they would have to pay the $10 for entry, a fee they were reluctant to pay. However, a person in line offered Justin a guest pass, but they didn't have one for Chris or Chris's girlfriend, 
so they decided to head back home. Justin said he wanted to remain at the bar and they would find a ride home later. Justin entered Wild Bill's at 11.38 p.m., joining over 2,000 other people inside. Now, I want to veer off for a second here. I was trying to confirm this. I did a lot of research with this, and we're going to have a lot to go over with the perspective. I've heard some different things as far as how many people were at Wild Bill's that night. And from what I can gather, the facility could hold up to two to 3,000 people. But I've seen some mixed reviews on how many people were actually there. Yes, it held that many people. And in some cases, I've heard there were that many people there that night. I've also heard there were closer to two or 300. Uh, obviously, when you have a case like this, that's very important. The more people, the more potential witnesses. But I can tell you this from what I've seen from the videos, the place was pretty packed. So it wasn't like it was dead in there. It wasn't like there was nobody around. But just keep that in mind that, you know, there's a big difference between two or 300 and two or 3,000. Around an hour later, at 12.55 a.m., on what is now November 2nd, Justin attempted to call a friend for a ride. Unfortunately, his friend was unable to help, leaving Justin without a way home. Over the next hour, Justin made more than 20 calls to 11 different people, trying to get a ride home. According to Atlanta Magazine, Justin was not the type to hire a taxi, even if he had the cash to do so. He also wasn't the type to reach out to his parents, despite them always assuring him that he could call them anytime. Justin's mom, Erica, later told the media that she thought Justin didn't call because he didn't want to disappoint them. At 2 a.m., Justin was seen in the Wild Bills parking lot making another call for a ride home. This call was to Chris, the friend who had gone to the club with Justin earlier that night. Justin told Chris that he was desperate for a ride, but Chris said he didn't want to wake up his girlfriend's father and ask to borrow the car again. After getting off the phone with Chris, Justin didn't make any other calls and unfortunately, he never made it home. Justin's parents grew increasingly concerned when he failed to return home by the morning of the second. He had plans to assist Stephen in cleaning out some gutters, but he never showed up. This was highly unusual for Justin, who had a reputation for being reliable. Erica and Stephen initially held on to the hope that he had crashed at a friend's place and would be home later that day. However, as the time passed, this scenario seemed less likely. Several days went by and there was still no sign of Justin. So on November 4th, Erica decided to report her son missing. The Gwinnett County Sheriff's Office launched an investigation attempting to trace Justin's cell phone activity and review surveillance footage from the vicinity of Wild Bills. They were able to determine that Justin didn't use his phone after 2 a.m. on the 2nd. However, they weren't able to figure out what happened to him after that. Additionally, police conducted interviews with people who had been at Wild Bills on the night of the 1st. Witnesses stated that Justin appeared to be sober, However, his friends revealed that Justin often used a fake ID, leaving open the possibility that he may have been intoxicated. Police asked Justin's friends if there was anyone who would want to hurt him. According to an article in Atlanta Magazine, the friends could think of one person. They recounted an incident from a few months prior when Justin and a friend started, quote, car hopping in Athens. This involved searching for unlocked vehicles and stealing whatever valuables they found inside. Now, this is something that is uh, very familiar to me as a former detective, as a former police officer. We would see this often in the surrounding community where you would go up and basically, it doesn't even have to be a hardened criminal. Sometimes it was teenagers who would go around hand checking car doors. That's what we basically referred to it as. And this was a common thing, looking for loose change if you left your cell phone in there or whatever. But usually it was more money because they were looking to buy booze from the store or whatever. Again, again, not condoning it. The reason I bring this up is I hope I don't want anybody to listen to this and automatically think, oh, Justin was a criminal. Not saying what, what he was doing was right, but I will say it's a pretty common thing and let's not put too much judgment on him at this point. Again, he shouldn't have been doing it, but, uh, but it, it could have been a lot worse. At one point, Justin and his friend heard about a car that supposedly belonged to a drug dealer and potentially contained a substantial amount of cash. However, upon reaching the location, they spotted the drug dealer sitting on his porch, causing them to abandon their plan. It remains unclear whether this tip led to any further action, as investigators have never said anything publicly. The police waited until November 6 to notify the public of Justin's disappearance. Erica spoke to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and expressed her distress, saying, quote, I haven't slept in days. I'm going out of my mind. She added, quote, I don't know if he left with someone or if he tried to crash there, but it's not like him not to come home. In the following week, the police continued their investigation into Justin's disappearance. 
However, they did not conduct any official searches and treated the case as a missing persons investigation rather than a potential crime. Now, I'm putting this in here not to condemn the police. In fact, they're doing it the right way. The only thing you have here, based on the amount of evidence that you have, is a missing persons case. Uh, you may suspect certain things, but you can't necessarily classify it as that. However, when you're looking at these cases, missing persons cases specifically, you can evaluate the situation and take action and obviously put a le higher level of severity on that case depending on the circumstances surrounding it. So in this particular case, if you have a healthy young man that you see uh, on camera at this bar and all of a sudden he just drops off the map and it doesn't seem like that's something he normally did and it didn't seem like he was in a bad mental state where he might have hurt himself, you can raise the level um, of work that's going into it initially. Uh, even though he's technically an adult. And so in this case, you can do a preliminary search and kind of cross your eyes, dot your T's to make sure he's not at any family's house or friend's house. And once you've done all that and you haven't found him, you can, you can push it a little bit harder and, and bring in the other uh, sources that you need, other agencies, whatever that may be, to escalate the case and, and try to find this person as soon as possible. So again, I'm not putting that in here to say, hey, listen, they did it wrong. Uh, in fact, it's they did it right. That's the only way you can classify this initially. But again, depending on the police department, they can decide how much emphasis they're putting on that missing person case immediately. Due to the police's lack of search efforts, Justin's family took it upon themselves to organize several volunteer searches. They also established a tip line, offered a reward of $50,000, and hired a private investigator. By November 14th, Justin had still not been located. The police informed the media that they had no leads and disclosed that individuals who knew Justin were not cooperating, which hindered the progress of the investigation. Justin's friend Chris, who had accompanied him to Wild Bills, later explained to Atlanta Magazine that he was uncooperative because he was frustrated with how the police were treating his girlfriend. Again, another side note here, I don't know what was said, I don't know what was done, but at the end of the day, if Justin's your friend, uh, regardless of what the police may be saying or how they're conducting their business, they, they, they might be a little direct. They may not be the most caring or, 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 or nice when they come to you, but ultimately you have the same goal. It's to find Justin. So I don't think the right, the right move here is to just not cooperate at all, especially when you're one of the last people to see Justin alive. On November 14th, a nonprofit search and rescue team called Texas EquiSearch arrived to assist in the search for Justin. They used all-terrain vehicles, horses, helicopters, and boats with sonar equipment to complete their search. The involvement of EquiSearch marked a significant development in the investigation, as most of the previous searches had been conducted by individuals with little to no experience, primarily consisting of Justin's family and friends. While EquiSearch conducted their searches, Justin's family members distributed flyers and posters around town. Despite their efforts, no significant findings emerged from these searches. And after only three days of searching, the EquiSearch team suspended their operations allowing their volunteers to return home to celebrate Thanksgiving with their families. However, Justin's loved ones were determined to carry on the search even after the team left town. Erica told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, quote, I'll never give up on finding my baby, never. Following the three-day search, reporting on Justin's case slowed way down. In early February of 2008, more than three months following Justin's disappearance, the police made an announcement regarding their belief that foul play was involved. They explained that they had been investigating various leads associated with foul play, but unfortunately, they had not discovered any concrete evidence. The police urged individuals to step forward and share any tips they may have. For quite some time, Justin's family had harbored suspicions that foul play was involved in his disappearance. Stephen told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, quote, I think he went to the club, I think he left the club, and I think he got a ride with somebody. After three months, it's hard not to think it was the wrong ride. By May, police had no leads and were at a standstill in the investigation. They had gathered various pieces of evidence they thought might be linked to the case, and 75 pieces of evidence were sent to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation for analysis. Unfortunately, the specific details about the evidence were never disclosed. Meanwhile, Erica had made it her full-time job to uncover the truth about what happened to her son. She transformed her garage into a home office where she tirelessly created buttons, bumper stickers, and flyers. Additionally, she raised funds, managed a website, and handled the tip line. 
Erica shared with the Athens Journal Constitution that she believed Justin had mistakenly accepted a ride from the wrong person, but she still clung to the hope that he was alive. She said, quote, Every day I cry, pray, and hope for answers. A few months later, in August, Erica spoke to the Atlanta Journal Constitution again. She expressed her frustration about the delay in starting official searches for Justin's case, which took two weeks. She believed that the delay might be the reason why Justin hadn't been found. Erica said that the first 72 hours are, quote, so important after someone goes missing, yet families often lack the crucial information needed during that time frame. The family's private investigator explained to the Constitution that investigations for missing adults are typically not initiated immediately, as adults have the right to disappear. Consequently, investigations often commence after the critical 72-hour period, which can have a negative impact on the case. To address this issue, Erica established a nonprofit organization called the Justin Time Foundation. The foundation assists in creating flyers, raising funds, coordinating volunteers, and hiring private investigators. So in this particular matter, it's kind of what I was saying earlier. Yes, it's a missing persons case, but depending on the specifics of that case, the police department can treat it any way they like. If it's someone who goes missing every other week, they're a wayward, disobedient child where they're constantly running away. To tell you the truth, the police department may not put as many resources into finding them if they know more than likely they're going to tur turn up. But in this particular case, when you have someone where you have evidence of them leaving a bar and then all of a sudden just, le you know, disappearing. And again, there's no signs that they were suicidal. There's no signs that there were problems in the household where they would have run away. Um, this is out of character for this individual where they're, they're usually reliable and on time and they usually return home. Um, they didn't tell any of their friends or family that they were going somewhere that night. I think in that particular case, even though it's usually 72 hours before the case really ramps up, in that first 24 to 48 hours, even in the first 12 hours, you as administrators of the police department, you can facilitate a situation where officers are going door to door, family members, friends, to kind of rule out the possibility that he is sleeping on a couch somewhere or that he did return back to school without telling anyone. You can start to check those boxes off. So after about 24 hours, if you've checked into all the areas where he could be and he's not there, now you can really escalate the matter. You can put out a bolo. You could enter him into NCIC as a missing person so uh, other surrounding agencies are notified. So there's, there's things you can do. You don't have to wait that 72-hour period. And I do agree with Erica that those first 72 hours are critical. And if you're going to get this person home, if they're in fact really missing, um, that's the time that you're going to get the most information that may help down the road. All right, so now back to Justin's case. In an effort to bring additional tips, the police shared that Justin had been caught on surveillance cameras at Wild Bills. According to the footage, Justin was seen leaving the establishment at approximately 1.30 a.m., holding a cell phone to his ear. His walking suggested that he was not under the influence of alcohol. According to the Atlanta Magazine, it was suspected that Justin had a confrontation with two men right before he left. However, once he was captured on surveillance footage, he seemed to be composed and there was no indication of anyone following him. Unfortunately, this footage didn't bring any major leads, and over the next few years, the case came to a standstill. In 2014, police made the announcement that they believed Justin had been murdered and the suspected perpetrator or perpetrators were from the neighboring county of Walton. As part of their investigation, the police began excavating an old well in Decula, Georgia, hoping to find Justin's remains. This search was prompted by a tip suggesting that Justin's body had been disposed of in a well, but unfortunately, they didn't find any evidence indicating that Justin had been there. In 2015, Justin's case took a significant turn when Dylan Glass, a man who had become an informant for the authorities, came forward with critical information. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution reported that Dylan's involvement began after he was arrested on unrelated state and federal drug charges. He started cooperating with the police and shared various details, indicating what happened to Justin. According to Dylan, he took Justin's diamond earring and physically attacked him, but he claimed that he was not responsible for Justin's death. Dylan's story was that he and another individual named Martin Wilkie assaulted Justin during an encounter that, quote, ultimately led to him being shot to death. After stealing Justin's diamond earring, Dylan, Martin, and a third person disposed of Justin's body in the High Shoals area of Walton County. A woman who claimed to have witnessed the murder corroborated Dylan's story. Additionally, police found a photo of Dylan taken on November 2nd. The photo showed Dylan wearing a diamond stud earring that looked extremely similar to the earring 
that Justin was wearing when he disappeared. WBIR reported that police later got a hold of the earring in the picture, but were unable to find Justin's DNA on it. Now, I got to tell you, and, and, and I'm going to refer to this a little bit more in the perspective, but there's, there's a podcast that I happened to find uh, almost right before recording this episode where up to this point, um, the whereabouts of this earring, how the police got a hold of it, or if they even did get a hold of it, was, was kind of a mystery to me. So I was listening to this podcast, and I want to give them some credit. It's the Unfound Podcast. And essentially, it's an interview with Erica. It's almost two hours long if you want to go check it out. I found it on YouTube. And in this interview, Erica states that the way they got a hold of this earring was that Dylan uh, went to a pawn shop and tried to pawn it off. And uh, police were made aware of it, and they seized the earring and, and, and took it in and tested the DNA on it but couldn't find anything. Obviously, this earring could be Justin's earring and just not have any DNA on it. They might have cleaned the earring before bringing it in there. Or it could be a different earring. But according to Erica, if you listen to the interview, uh, it is very similar to the earring that Justin owned. Also, from some preliminary research, there's no other pictures of Dylan wearing an earring like that in the past before this whole incident took place. So it is kind of speculative, but I will say on the timing of it all and the fact that Justin owned an earring like this, it is, it is highly, uh, highly suspicious and very, very interesting as far as this case is concerned. When Erica was told about Dylan's possible involvement in her son's disappearance, she was not surprised. She told Eleven Alive that she'd heard Dylan's name since day one. There was a rumor that he had told someone he killed Justin before she had even reported him missing. And I can confirm this again going back on this interview that I was just telling you about on the Unfound podcast. In that interview, she does in fact say that, again, nothing to substantiate it, but that she had heard very early on that Justin had called up an individual and said, hey, we just killed this guy. And uh, allegedly that phone call was made before Erica even reported her son missing to police. So if you were able to confirm that to be true, that would be an extremely critical part of this case and, and a, for a potential prosecution of Dylan. Despite all of this, Dylan was not charged with any crimes related to Justin's disappearance. The police said, quote, when it gets right down to it, when we ask him where the body is and we try to put closure to it, he's lied. And we catch him in another lie. He's not credible. Although he wasn't charged, Dylan was considered a main suspect in Justin's case. Based on Dylan's statement, Martin Wilkie was charged with concealing the death of Justin. Then another person came forward to corroborate Dylan's original statement to police. That person was his mother, Thelma Ballou. Around the same time that Dylan had been talking to police, Thelma was taken to jail on burglary charges. Three days after her arrest, she confessed to police that she had assisted Martin and another man in disposing of Justin's body. According to her statement, they had left his body in a well located in the High Shoals area of the Appalachie River. For three days, authorities conducted a thorough search of the area, but they failed to find any trace of Justin's remains or any evidence related to him at all. Subsequently, Thelma had another meeting with the police. During this interview, she confessed that she lied in an attempt to get herself out of trouble. As a result, she was charged with making false statements to police. Now, I'm sure you guys have probably put together at this point, this whole family, Dylan, Thelma, they're a good bunch of people. I, I will tell you, uh, there's an interview or there's a statement out there with Dylan. You can see a video of him. He's not just some good kid who had a couple issues. You can tell he's a career criminal, gang member it appears to be. And uh, he's just a bad dude, and I guess the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree when you look at what Thelma's getting getting into as well. Uh, so this is not this is not good when you think about it in the context of what could have happened to Justin, because this family uh, does appear to all be into this criminal element, which means if one of them did do something, it's highly likely that the other would help them cover it up. Despite Thelma's admission of lying, the police believe that some of the information she had initially provided could be valuable. However, the Gwinnett County District Attorney was skeptical due to the fact that Thelma's story changed multiple times. Dylan was never charged with anything in relation to Justin's disappearance, and the case slowed down again. In November of 2017, Erica spoke to Eleven Alive for the 10-year anniversary. She said, quote, I still have hope that he could still walk in that door. Erica talked about how she often thought about what Justin would be like at 29 years old. She said, quote, I mean, in 10 years, he would have been graduated from college. What would he be doing? It's hard to see, you know, to realize everything he's missed, like our oldest son's wedding, 
his first niece being born, his sister graduating from college. Police also spoke to Eleven Alive. They assured the public that Justin's case was not considered cold, and they were continuing to actively pursue new leads and investigate the matter thoroughly. The police shared their theory regarding Justin's disappearance. According to multiple witnesses, while Justin was inside Wild Bill's, he was seen wearing a diamond stud earring and displaying cash. This led police to believe that he may have drawn the attention of the wrong person, the type of person who had set Justin up for a robbery. At around 2 a.m., Justin was standing in the parking lot, attempting to call for a ride. It was during that time that someone managed to lure him into a car, possibly a blonde woman wearing a black dress. The car then drove Justin to a house party located in Snellville. After getting out of the car, Justin went into the garage, where he was immediately subjected to a brutal attack. Police suspect that he was assaulted, strangled, and ultimately shot. During this violent encounter, Justin's attacker stole both his money and his diamond earring. Justin's body was placed in a white 1984 Chevy work van, which was subsequently driven to a houseboat situated on Lake Lanier. To conceal the evidence, the culprits weighed down his body and discarded it into a cold lake. A few days later, on November 5th, Justin's killers realized that his body had floated to the surface of the lake. They removed his body, put it into a toolbox, then transported him to a well somewhere along the Appalachie River. Police told Eleven Alive that the van suspected to have been used in Justin's murder was, quote, gone forever. Right after Justin went missing, so did the van. Furthermore, the owner of the house, van, and houseboat, who was possibly involved in Justin's death, died earlier in 2017. Now, unfortunately, up to this point, the police have not gathered enough evidence to prove their theory, but I will expound on what I said there because, again, in this interview, Erica talked extensively uh, uh, about this, this theory, and there's a little bit of some confusion as far as where this theory is coming from, but I will tell you that very early on in Justin's disappearance, there was an FBI agent who was from the area who reached out to Erica directly and did help her on, on a couple things. The FBI was never directly involved, but obviously this agent was able to use his position of authority to get information. For example, uh, Erica wanted the videotapes from Wild Bill's she was struggling to get that. When he got involved, within a day or two, the videotapes were given to her. Um, and from what she was saying, it was actually this FBI agent who went out and looked for this van and was, was unable to find it. Now, as far as the owner, from what I can gather, and again, this is all speculative, um, so I, I qualify it with that because there's no, again, it's still an open investigation, so we're going off the pieces of information that we have, but it is in my opinion, coming from a somewhat reliable source in Erica. She states that this whole theory comes from a couple different things. There was an individual by the name of James, allegedly, who, who has also unfortunately passed away, who went to college with Justin and saw him that night at Wild Bill's uh, get into a car with a blonde wearing a black dress. Uh, now, again, he's passed away since then, so... Uh, there's really not much more you can do with it, but I do think it holds some value because this wasn't just some random person who had seen Justin's poster after the fact. Uh, he, he knew who Justin was personally because he went to school with him. And as far as this van and, and the specificity of it, it's coming from a place where allegedly the, the owner of this van and the houseboat may have been Thelma's, Dylan's mother, uh, Thelma's boyfriend. And he owned the, the van, he owned the houseboat, and uh, this, this whole thing might have taken place at his home. So I'm going to get into it more with the perspective later, but that was basically the theory that Erica had laid out on this podcast, and that's where this is coming from. And, and I will say just initially, before we get into the perspective in a few, a few minutes, it does, in my opinion, hold a, hold a lot of weight. The last update we have in Justin's case came in 2022 when police said that they were still looking into Justin's case. By this point, investigative efforts had been narrowed down to Walton County, and the investigation was being spearheaded by the Walton County Sheriff's Cold Case Homicide Unit. And that's really what we have, and that's when we're gonna transition uh, into my perspective on this investigation. You guys are gonna have to bear with me here because I will tell you, <laughs> I have pages of notes, and I'm gonna try to consolidate them to make them all make sense. They make sense in my head, but I want to make sure that they're understandable to you. Before I get into anything, I want to start by qualifying again that because this is an open investigation, uh, it is very likely, 
I can almost guarantee it, that the police know a lot more than what's being publicly said. And so when I give my opinions on this investigation, we have to consider the fact that I don't have the entire case file. And if I did, some of these opinions may change. I do want to commend the police department because again, in that podcast interview, Erica stated that there were multiple times where the sheriff's office would allow the private investigator to sit in on those meetings and discuss different ideas of how they could approach this case. So kudos to them for that, because as she even said in her interview, that's not a normal practice. I can confirm that. So the fact that they were open to that is a good thing. That means they put their egos aside and they, they all want the same thing. They want to solve this case. So let's first talk about the timeline. Okay. So we have uh, this video surveillance footage. Erica has a lot of it. There's some that's been put out by the media. Erica had said in her interview, she had a lot more, but essentially you see, you see Justin coming out of wild bills. He's on his phone. And then according to her, he walks around the corner of the building to like the backside parking lot. She did, she did state that there's a bigger parking lot in front of Wild Bill's. And although it's not as popular to go behind the building, there are parking spots back there. So it wasn't like he was going into a dark alley by himself and nobody else was around. That was a, that was a place that some people would go. Um, she speculated that maybe he was on the phone and he couldn't really hear, which is why he went to the back side of the building. Apparently there was a camera back there, but it just wasn't operable. So there were some witnesses that reported seeing him sitting on a bench back there talking on the phone. Um, but again, we have nothing to confirm that because the camera footage wasn't available. Now, what I also learned from this interview with Erica was that if Justin had decided to walk home, it was a very popular residential area. There was even like a highway road for cars that uh, there would have been a lot of people that would have seen him walking. That would have been witnesses who said, yeah, I saw a guy walking down the road who matched that description. Or there might've even been some cameras for all we know, maybe not ring cameras, but some, some type of camera system that may have picked him up. This wasn't a rural area where if he had walked, he was been just be walking miles of woods and he would have never been seen and he could have been taken at any point. So I do think it's very likely based on what we know and based on what, what the path was, if he had decided to walk home that he never left Wild Bill's on foot. He, he did leave in a vehicle. And when we think about the witness testimony from James, I find that to be credible, the fact that he knew Justin personally. And now this blonde who is wearing a black dress, she may not be blonde anymore. And, and also James could have gotten the hair color wrong, but she, she was light in hair color. And when you really think about it, let's just be realistic for a second, okay? When, when you go to a bar, you know, you go in there to have some drinks, maybe meet a man or a woman, someone you might want to hang out with afterwards. It's very possible that Justin was back there. He wasn't able to get a ride. And then maybe an attractive girl comes through and they have a quick conversation and she offers to give him a ride. But in this particular case, I don't think she would have necessarily said, Hey, I'll give you a ride home. And there is a reason for that. Uh, in this interview that Erica conducted with the unfound podcast, she stated that the last ping from Justin's phone was around 2 a.m. And it was four miles in the opposite direction of where their home would have been. So, and it was more in the, it was heading towards Lake Lanier. So my theory based on that is that more than likely this young lady uh, might've said, hey, I'm going to a party. Uh, if you wanna come, you can come with me. It's out near Lake Lanier. And Justin being a young guy, attractive girl, might have said, sure, no problem. Now, I will tell you, has it's been a very long time, but I've had a situation like that, and I've conducted cases like this where some girl bring who was invited to the party brings a, a male friend with her, and the guys who are already at the party who are supposed to be there are very threatened by this, and they don't like it. And they may not indicate that to the female, but they very quickly, indirectly let the male know that he's not welcome. And that could be the situation. I know that there's a theory that this was a robbery that was set up. That is possible as well. But here's my problem with that. I would think that if Dylan or Martin were at Wild Bill's, we would know about it at this point. So more than likely they weren't there. It could have been one of their co-conspirators that spotted him and then instructed this blonde to go talk to him. But I think more than likely the more reasonable situation is this girl knew where this party was, maybe didn't know everybody who was going to be there, but found Justin attractive. He was, he was a very good looking guy and maybe said, Hey, do you want to hang out? Come with me. 
So they get in the car, they drive out to this party, and maybe it happens almost immediately, or maybe it happens after a half hour or so. We don't know. And, and it really doesn't matter too much because I think, and I'm going to get into this more, but I do think Dylan uh, and Thelma are telling a partial truth. I do think that they were involved and yet they may be uh, lying about some of the details to try to throw it off a little bit because they don't want to be too specific as far as, you know, implicating themselves. But, I, you know, I don't necessarily know if they would have carried out this whole robbery plan for one diamond stud earring, which, by the way, as Erica said in this interview, wasn't even real. It was a cubic zirconia. So they get out there. Things go south. A fight ensues. Justin wasn't a small kid. I'm sure he fought back. But if it's three on one, four on one, it's not going to be much of a fight. It escalates. And eventually, Justin is shot. And I do think that although Dylan and Thelma have, have told us certain things, I do still think they're lying. We see this all the time where individuals who are involved will give you parts of the truth, but omit other parts. And it's it's weird sometimes because the parts they omit don't really matter as much. But for some reason, they just have a hard time giving you the whole truth. They want to make you work for it. It's, it's frustrating, but I see it all the time. And then as far as all the specifics as to what happened to Justin after his death, you know, this is where it comes back to what I said at the beginning of this whole perspective, which is I believe police have more information than what they're sharing. It may be from confidential informants. It may be from confidential witnesses. And it may be a combination of what um, the private investigator and this FBI agent had gathered through their own personal investigations. But I do believe as they were putting all the witness testimony together, putting Dylan's statement together, putting the timeline together, a lot of things overlapped where this story made sense as far as what happened to Justin um, they had the van. They were able to confirm that this van was owned by Thelma's alleged boyfriend, and it just disappeared. They even have the VIN number for it. It's out there. And uh, again, th after this occurred, the van disappeared, which is unfortunate because it could have been processed for forensics. And then he did own this house, or this houseboat over on the lake, so it would have given them an opportunity to go over there and dispose of the body before police were able to go to the house and conduct a search warrant. I will also say that during her interview, again, and this is a great interview, if you're, if you're interested in this case, which I hope you all are, I strongly recommend you go check it out. The video only had like 2,000 views on it, which is a shame, but you guys can probably help with that. Um, she did say that, again, this is from Erica, that there's proof that, that the white Chevy van that I referred to, the 1984 white Chevy van, was seen at the marina that this houseboat was located at around 5 or 6 a.m. the morning after uh, Justin disappeared. So if we're to believe that's what happened, it lines up where something happens at 2, 3 in the morning, and by 5 or 6, they're at the marina disposing of Justin's body. I'll talk quickly about the prosecution or lack thereof in this case. I'm not a lawyer. I don't pretend to be. There's other individuals out there who are more qualified for this. Uh, I know I had mentioned that the charges against Thelma and Martin were both dismissed and, and Dylan has never been charged. And some of you may look at that as a bad thing. Uh, and it's not a it's not a great thing, obviously. But I'll also say the fact that law enforcement hasn't charged any of them with Justin's death, with a homicide, um, that's a good thing because that means they can still be charged. Uh, if they go forward with the case right now and they miss, as I've said to you guys before on Crime Weekly, and I might have even said it here, Double jeopardy comes into play. And even if you have video footage of them committing the crime, you can't charge them again. So I think right now what they have is a lot of circumstantial evidence. And most of that circumstantial evidence is based on their own testimony and their proven liars. So it does make a really weak case. And I think the district attorney, the AG's office is really concerned about going forward with this at this point, because more than likely it, they, they would probably get acquitted. And then, and then you can't do anything in the future. They walk free forever. Now, I do want to mention one more update with Justin's case that I, I just stumbled on again today as I was going over my final notes for this, for this episode tonight. And that's that they did find skeletal remains along Lake Lanier, and they, they thought that it could be Justin. But unfortunately, they did confirm this year that those, those remains did not belong to Justin. All right, so as far as my suggestions in this case, and again, this is without knowing what investigators have done behind closed doors, um, I do have some things that I, I would, if I were working this case, I would do if they hadn't already been done. 
And, and hopefully if someone's listening that has involvement with this case, by all means, if you're working this case, you want to reach out to me, do so. I'll be more than happy to speak with you. So there's a few things that I'm interested in. First off, this house, this house that was owned by Thelma's boyfriend. I know it's been many years, but if the current owners are willing to cooperate, you could get a search warrant. And if the residence does in fact have a garage and the current residents are okay with it, maybe do a luminol test. I know it's been many years, so it may not... It may not work out, but what do you have to lose? Do a luminol test. See if you can find any remnants of blood. Large, If, if you shot in the garage, there's going to be a lot of blood or evidence of cleaning up a lot of blood. Now, again, this might turn out to be not worth anything because so many years have passed, but what do you have to lose? Maybe they've already done it. If they have, great. But if they haven't, might be worth taking a shot at. I would also consider doing the same thing with this boathouse if it's still around. See if you can find it. Anything where Justin might have been during that evening it's worth getting a search warrant for. And maybe now with new owners, they'll be more cooperative and allow you to do it with even out a search warrant. They might just sign a consent to search and let you do what you have to do. Um, again, it's been many years, so it's going to make it difficult. And as far as from an evidentiary standpoint in court, even if you find blood, the argument could be made that it was, it, it was there after um, the, the suspects moved out. I'm doing that in air quotes if you're watching on video. So it would make it tough. But as an investigator, I would still want to know. If we loom in all the garage or this houseboat, if it's still floating and there's this big spot of where a blood cleanup occurred, I'm going to be noting it. If it gets thrown out in court, that's fine. I'm going to throw it at the wall and see if it sticks, as they say. Now I want to talk about Justin's phone and also the phones of the suspects that I've mentioned here tonight. There's a lot of numbers that supposedly Justin called for a ride that night. First thing I would do is I would be looking to see if any of those numbers belonged to a female that was had light-colored hair or was a blonde that might have been around that night. Um, did he get in touch with someone who was a friend of his who was potentially going to this party and picked him up on the way? I would like to think that detectives already did this, but if they didn't, that is something I would do. Secondly, when it comes to the suspects like Dylan, like Martin, like Thelma, we need to get their phone records. We need to get their GPS coordinates. If we still can, it might be too late now. And we need to reverse engineer this because here's the thing. If they're directly involved, they have a lot to lose. So are they going to be completely cooperative? Probably not. However, if this female took Justin to this party, not knowing what was going to happen to him, if you can find her and apply a little pressure, she may be more incentivized to cooperate with police. Because the reality is you could charge her as an accomplice and let her know that, listen, if you're not with us, you're against us. And as someone who wasn't directly involved, if you want to prove that, you need to work with us. So you really have to reverse engineer this case and find out the connection between this female, Dylan or Martin or Thelma, because more than likely in their contact list and their phone records on their phones, if this blonde girl theory is true, more than likely she's a friend of either theirs or someone who was at the party. So either an acquaintance of Dylan or directly connected to Dylan. And if you do the work, and I'm not saying it wouldn't be a lot of work, it would take a lot of time. You might be able to go through each and every number, compare the numbers to the people that own them, and maybe find someone who matches the description of that girl. And then by speaking with her, find out where she was on the night of Justin's disappearance. And as I already said, I would also go and try to get the GPS coordinates for Dylan, Martin, and Thelma. I don't know if they'd be able to do it now. I would hope that when this investigation was originally conducted or when Dylan came into the scenario, that they would have gone back and tried to do that again. Too much time might have passed, but it's worth a shot. And finally, I want to say, I know right now we, we do not have a body in this case, which is always something that makes attorneys apprehensive about charging anyone with a homicide. And, I, and I'll also say this, as you're seeing the title of this episode, um, it's still labeled missing because in fact, Justin is missing and I'm hoping, and I'm sure his family is hoping that he's going to come home one day. But based on what we know, it, it does not look great. And I, I think even Erica would acknowledge that. So although we don't have a body and we may presume that Justin is no longer with us, there have been many cases where individuals have been convicted of murder without a body. Um, so we got to work on the circumstantial evidence. And if we feel 
that Justin may never be found in a relatively reasonable period of time, at some point you got to say, okay, this is what we have. We're going to write the best report we can. We're going to put it all together and we're going to present it to a jury of their peers and see what they say. And maybe bring that to Erica and, and see her feelings on it and say, listen, it's a big risk, but if you're willing to do this, so are we. And at that point, you have to live with the results regardless of what they are. Do I think we're there yet? No, I don't. I feel very optimistic about this case overall. There's a lot that can be done. People know what happened to Justin Gaines. And I'm not just talking about Dylan and Martin. There were other people that were there. And it seems like they have big mouths. It may be members of this, this gang that they were involved in. But other people know what happened to Justin. And you just got to find them. You got to incentivize them. Maybe it means an arrest of someone else. And again, they roll on Dylan or, some, or, or Martin or whoever is involved. And I think that's what they're kind of waiting for. But th this case is still relatively new in the eyes of, of a cold case. And, and I, I have a lot of hope for this one. And I think at some point we will see movement in it and hopefully we'll see some charges and then ultimately a conviction so that Justin gets the justice he deserves and the people responsible are held accountable. One final thing about this case, and this is in, in no way victim blaming Justin, but I just want to reiterate, I don't care if you're male, if you're a female, if you're 6'4", 250 pounds, or 5'4", 110 pounds. We have to be careful out there. So if you're going to go out, regardless if it's an establishment you've been to 100 times, make sure you're going with at least one friend. Don't go alone. There's too many bad people out there that are looking for individuals who are by themselves, both male and female. So put yourself in a situation where if you're going to go out, make sure you have at least one friend with you that evening. And also, if you're going to go out, make sure you consider what you're wearing as far as expensive jewelry. Uh, we see it all the time where you may be somewhere because you're proud of whatever item you own. And someone who has malicious intentions may be there and sees you by yourself or even with a friend and wants whatever you have. And they, in some cases, will take a life to get it. And you have to ask yourself if it's worth it to go out that night just to show off that watch or that ring or that necklace. Um, because if they confront you, you may not even be given the opportunity to just hand it over. And uh, I would much rather have you than that piece of jewelry. So consider that when you're going out. We should be able to wear those nice things, but we do live in a world where there's some, some monsters amongst us. And we ha unfortunately have to play defense when, when we're going out at night on our own or even with our friends. That's going to do it from my perspective. And as a reminder, 18-year-old Justin went missing on November 2nd, 2007. He was last seen at around 2 a.m. at Wild Bills in Duluth, Georgia. At the time of his disappearance, Justin was 5'11", muscular build at around 210 pounds. He has blue eyes, brown hair, and he was last seen wearing a long sleeve gray shirt with Abercrombie written on the front, blue jeans with holes in them, and flip-flops. He also had that diamond stud earring. If you have any information, you can call the Gwinnett County Police Department Criminal Investigation Section at 770-513-5000 or the Walton County Sheriff's Office Investigator at 770-266-1558. And speaking of contact information, I've already been getting a lot of submissions from you guys. Thank you for that. Um, DMs through Instagram is not going to be the way or emailing Crime Weekly or even my personal email. That's not the way either. The best way to submit cases to us is cases at detectiveperspectivepod.com. That's going to go to a joint email that myself and Haley, our research team, have. And, and we're going to look at all the cases, but I'll be honest with you, we're going to prioritize uh, cases where individuals who have been directly affected, whether they're a family member or a friend, but they've submitted a case for their loved one, we want to, we want to try to help them out. That's what this show's all about. So we're going to put those guys at the top of the priority list, and I, and I don't think any of you will have an issue with that. I want to thank you guys for joining me here on another episode. And if you if you made it to the end of this video or you're listening on audio, please comment down below. Let me know what you think about this investigation. I also want to send my thoughts out to Erica, Justin's mom. I really hope that you and your family get the justice that you deserve very soon. And I hope that the people responsible for what happened to Justin are held accountable. Everyone stay safe out there. I'll see you soon.